So now we'll proceed to the second session, which is on CNS embryonal tumors, finding certainty in uncertainty. Uh, I request the chairpersons to please uh, come up on the stage. Uh, Dr. Dinesh uh, Singh, he is the senior director and head of department of radiation oncology at Max Super Speciality Hospital, Vaishali. And uh, Dr. Nitin Gurg, he is consultant neurosurgeon, Bansal Hospital, and also the director of uh, Brain Tumor Support Group and Awareness Foundation India, Bhopal. Uh, also, one small request can we take all the question and answers at the end of the entire session at the time of final take home polls? So that we can, uh, you know, cover up some time. Uh, so, Doctor Nitin Gurg, is he there? All right. So, uh, may I now request the chairperson uh, to please invite the speakers for the next talk? Uh, very uh, warm good afternoon. And it has been a very uh, lovely and very interesting uh, discussions which we are having very stimulating and uh, I would like to invite uh, our uh, first speaker Dr. Rupesh Kumar and uh, to speak on optimal surgical techniques and pearls for medulloblastoma and other abnormal tumors with CNS learn the playing field. Dr. Rupesh Kumar. Thank you. Respected chairpersons, teachers, colleagues and friends. Doubts are I thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak in this August forum. Moving on from gliomas to the much more difficult tumors, um, embryonal tumors, especially the medullos, and I'm glad that this topic was given to me. This is the 2021 classification of uh, embryonal tumors, which has again the limelight is medulloblastoma anyway. But there are other newer entities which have been described, like ribriform neuroepithelial, which we've never heard or seen. Maybe we'll be seeing in the future soon. As the we conventionally, we know that the medulloblastoma is a disease, a surgical disease. The better the resection, the better the outcome we have been known. And this has been proved right from the Albright's article that the residual disease less than 1.5 centimeters cube translates into a better functional outcome, oncological outcome. And so we all know about so past two decades. However, some debate on this uh, paper from Thompson et al. tell that it is not really so. There is no real benefit of gross total resection over. Uh, uh, STR and the road, but this is like still debatable topic. But the standard of care should be a safe maximal resection in medulloblastoma. There is sometimes we previously it's a small volume residual disease. We again go in and a relook surgery. But then in this paper, he has described that it is not really indicated if it is a high risk for a surgery because of neurological deterioration. So as surgeons, now we have to take a balance. On one side, the oncological outcome; the other side is the neurological outcome. So there's a fine line to draw, and then it's walking on a string. So the best thing should be a safe maximal resection because these are the tumors after surgery are going for adjuvant therapy, a neurological deterioration, a moribund status, we are delaying the adjuvant therapy. So overall outcome is going to be bad. So there's a very fine balance we should keep always in our mind treating these young children with medulloblastomas and other difficult embryonal tumors. Needless to say, the surgery has a significant role and most of these children come in an emergency ER with upset hydrocephalus, vomiting, altered sensorium. So we need to be very aggressive in our approach to improve the functional neurological outcome, leave alone the oncological outcome. So a good dissection, a good reduction in the tumor volume improves the outcome and facilitates the adjuvant therapy at the earlier and also improves. Studies have been shown that there's a good long-term survival in these children. As surgeon, I will restrict my topic towards the surgical strategies. So when a child with a medulloblastoma, what are the things which will run in the neurosurgeon's mind before taking up these children? Number one is that most of the times as I showed, it's a hydrocephalus, whether to deal with it or not, whether to directly go for a surgery or do a shunt and then delay the surgery removal, whether it is an NTR or a GTR we have already discussed. Sometimes the metastatic nodules in and around the primary are distant. What is the strategy surgical for that? Very hypervascular tumors. We should not be losing so much of blood because these are Young children, a small blood loss is also significant in young children. Lateral resection. More debatable is the residual tumor, what happens and what we should do, uh, recurrent tumors. So these are the things which will run in our mind. So basically, we have two approaches. Um, we had seen, heard this word, telovelar approach and a transvermian approach. These are the two conventional approaches we do for a medulloblastoma standard of care. C1 arch excision is something which uh, some surgeons prefer, some surgeons do not. I routinely do C1 arch excision because it gives a tangential view to look up towards the aqueduct of uh, Sylvius. More importantly, whenever we take up a case for surgery, the th few things uh, surgeons mind what it runs, whether there's a hydrocephalus. 
the tumor consistency. So in a T2, if a high definition T2, we can really know this is a soft tumor or a firm tumor. And also you can see this fine dot-like inside is going to be vascular tumor, a lot of vascular channels inside the tumor. So these are the things we should run in our mind. The more important is the tumor brainstem interface. So not along with the cerebellum, but the, the, we are interested in how the tumor is going to be attached to the floor of four ventricle because that will be the deterrent to leave behind the nodules around the brainstem. That should be, now we should run the scan and just see the flims. We should run through the scan and then carefully magnify, zoom and see what is the real interface between the brainstem and the tumor. As focus the near, cranial and the caudal extent, which can determine how we are going to approach this tumor. Very important is this extension, small resection extension towards the foramen of Lushka and then into the CP angle. So one need not miss it if you're removing the gross tutel. We may tend sometimes leave behind these nodules inside the foramen of Lushka. So we need to address these tumors as such. So this is one standard uh, example of uh, utility of advanced imaging in our center. This is a standard run of the mill medulloblastoma. All of you understand this is a large tumor occupying the floor of fourth ventricle and arising from the vermis, causing obstetric hydrocephalus. You can see that the fine, tiny dot like vascular markings in the right cerebellar hemisphere. Generally, we ignore this and uh, our radiologists picked it up and they did the perfusion studies. There's a very high perfusion in the right cerebellum parenchyma. So actually, this is a leptomeningeal disease along the cerebellum, which otherwise we will miss in a routine MRI. So that is the importance of doing perfusion studies routinely and we as a protocol routinely do in these tumors because some fine you know, things which we miss so that we can prognosticate these children, we can counsel the parents accordingly because there's not a simple disease, it's going to be a little bit advanced. And this is the post-op MRI of the same patient as we see that. Uh, excision of the primary tumor, but the leptomeningeal we left behind uh, because it was not very clear on the intraoperative thing, but though it, we know that there is a disease there. No, other things is that doing many centers still continue to do a post-op CT scan. As far as medullo is concerned, leave alone medullo, even other gliomas, it is better if possible to do an MRI because as surgeons, we learned so much uh, because what we think that we have removed the tumor on a CT scan, if we do an MRI, we'll actually see some residual disease. So getting an MRI is paramount importance in medulloblastoma. And uh, if so, if there is a residue, we don't hesitate. So in our center, we don't extubate the child after the surgery, take the patient to the MR, complete the MR, then only go to the ICU. We are in our instances where we're taking the child back if we are left behind residues in the MRI. So this is again a child eight-year-old standard typical presentation of a medulloblastoma large. It doesn't, the problem is if it doesn't come down into the foramen magnum, then this, this section is little tedious. You have to do a telovelar approach. Conventionally, we were doing a transvermian approach, splitting the vermis, but that includes a lot of morbidity postoperative. These children are ataxic and they have lot run through a difficult phase. So now we have now adapted our techniques towards a telovelar approach so that there's hardly any vermian resection and there's a natural cleavage there and we can even look up to that acute of sylvia. So that's why routinely we do. I'll show you some of the examples of how the vermis is nicely preserved in a postoperative MRI in these children. So this is just a video of um, how we routinely do. Can you play the video? Yeah, so this is the standard, um, I think, uh, just to see it's lagging behind. So this is a telovelar approach. As you see, we go in and uh, we remove these tumors. It's running, not running, playing well. Majority of the time, these tumors are soft, friable. It's not like you can hold it and remove, unlike a glioma, lower grade glioma. Usually, sometimes we are lucky enough to remove these tumors, as you see here, like this. It can be delivered nicely and uh, as an in mass. So, if it is a firm tumor, you can do that. But majority of the time, it is soft and suckable. That is a acute silvius. Usually, we tend to leave behind the tumors along the margins of the lateral surface. So, one need to angle the microscope and see these lateral margins are the where we usually leave behind the disease. And also, at the same time, we also look into the foramen of Lushka if we see the tumor there. So, this is a post op MRI as issue here. The vermis is intact. And um, I'll show you in subsequent examples. Most of the times, the senior registrars or junior consultants do these surgeries. And T2 image, as oncologists, we don't see the T2 images, we just see the contrast images. But the fineness of surgery, how the cerebellum is handled, how the brainstem is handled during surgery, we can know by looking at the T2 image. If the T2 image it is very clear, you don't see much infiltration, that means it's a very gentle handling of the tissues, and one can know senior consultants can guide the junior consultants based on the T2 images because these are some technical nuances which has to be taught to the junior colleagues. Again, telovelar translator approach, I'll see that. The vermis is there and post-op MRI, you can see that the vermis is intact. So 
That is the advantage of telovelar tonsillar. You'd hardly reset the vermis and that improves the post-operative outcome in these children. If the tumor is huge like this, and if already it comes, then it's not really transvermian. It is a trans tumor. The tumor itself has given the way. Large tumors are actually, in fact, easier rather than small tumors because tumors themselves give way to us to reach these tumors. And you can see this is a post of resection 2016, 19, and you can see it's a, uh, there's not much disease. Addressing the tumor, as I was mentioning you, the lateral recess towards the foramen of Lushka, we need to be careful. As you see here, there's a tiny nodule going towards the, on the left side. So one need to angle the microscope and then these are usually not adherent. Once you do a suction, usually it just generally comes out and we need not be aggressively dissecting it. We need to be careful because the lower cranialose exit through this foramen of Lushka. You can see the post-op MRI showing, addressing these tumors are of importance because one may leave behind the residual disease. Again, you see typical examples towards going towards the foramen of Lushka on the left side. These highly brightly enhancing, usually we think it's a highly vascular tumors and we need to be ready with our blood products because these young children. Unusual circumstances, sometimes this was a patient, little eldish and uh, thought to and referred to us as a meningium of the tentorium, it's a hard city, but then actually we know that these are sometimes middle old must behave uh, in elderly and little middle age, they can present like this. And again, instances of like this, again, this was not thought to be as a medulloblastoma, 22 year old male, and it was in fact a medulloblastoma. Sometimes you see these unusual circumstances, not run of the male medulloblastoma cases are need to be aware of. Now, the strategy of a residual disease, many times, in an oncology, high volume oncology center, you need, you get references for radiation. And then when surprised to see there's a significant residue, then it becomes very difficult to what to do for this. More than technically removing it, convincing the family that we need to go for another surgery before is a much more challenging thing, especially in the private sector. So this is some child, three year old, can see a large disease and operated somewhere in the Middle East and referred for proton therapy neuro institute. And uh, surprisingly, when we did a planning MRI, we found that there's a significant residual disease and it was actually increased compared to the pre-op. So we had to convince the patient's family was doctors. So it was easy for us to convince them to go for a second look surgery. And then we can see that this is more in the, not really in the vermis, it was more towards the brainstorm laterally. And so we used a retrosigmoid approach and we could remove this tumor completely. And then this facilitates the post-operative adjuvant therapy. And this is the follow-up MR after three months. You can see that the good disease oncological outcome is children. We need to follow up these children. Again, this is a similar location, but it was bang intrinsic. It was not a medulla, it was an ETMR. And uh, you can see already a biopsy was done through the fourth ventricle and it was deemed inoperable and this referred. Actually, a lot of things are discussed about the DTA. Can you run the DTA images? I'm not able to open. So when, they, when we do the DTA in these cases, if the tracks are not going through the tumor, we can in fact go and reset this tumor and the DTA was displaced anteriorly and laterally. So we decided we leave a cuff of tumor around the anteriorly and laterally, and then we could remove the tumor, the core of the disease significant, almost 70% decompression and then give the patient for radiation. Sometimes even large adults also we leave behind. Uh, we see the residual disease like this, and we can see that the tumor was posterior part of the tumor was left removed, and then the anterior portion, significant portion, still there in the fourth ventricle, and we have to go for a relook surgery. So most of these times we do an intra perioperative MRI to address that. We have removed these lesions. Redo cases are a little bit uh, challenging because of reconstruction, because we need to have a good CSF coverage, the wound complications, because they should be ready for the adjuvant therapy. So we have to be more concentrating on the wound closure as well, and not allow CSF leaks, which can delay the adjuvant therapy. More than residual disease, uh, recurrent disease is much more challenging to know. So we know that uh, as such, they are not good disease to handle. Recurrent medulloblastomas actually take follow the molecular studies. This SHH generally try to low a local recurrence compared to others, which can have a distant metastatic the biopsy, whenever we see a recurrence, we need to look at it and then we need to do biopsy and see, make sure that it's a post-treatment change or it's a real disease progression because that helps in planning the adjuvant therapy. So this is one child with four-year-old operated radiation post-chemotherapy in remission and then found the small nodule. Actually, in this follow-up MR, it was residual enlarging in size. One needs to be confused whether it's a treatment change or a residual disease, recurrent disease. And uh, we, our oncological team uh, requests us to take a, a resection of these. It is not in the attached to the brainstem, so it is a safe area. But the challenge here is too small. Gliosis, searching this nodule is more difficult. So unless you have a good neuro navigation, ultrasound guidance, so we could remove this nodule, though it was small, and then it was in fact a recurrent disease. The same child after 18 months came back. This is a small suspicious nodule in the foramen of Pandro. We're not sure whether it is. And uh, uh, our team requested whether we can do a biopsy. 
because in the ventricle we can do put a bur hole and do, do through the endoscope and we can see actually it was a nodule in the foramen of monroe and we could reset that and the frozen was showing again a disease not just treatment change the again major criteria dilemma is a hydrocephalus majority of the children have hydrocephalus to shunt them or not now there are a lot of criteria if the need be do not hesitate because delaying a shunt can delay adjuvant therapy so better that you do the shunt and then get the patient ready for a, a hydrocephalus um, uh, management. A few things about ATRT is not very common, but they are much more challenging because they occur in much younger age group, supratentorial, the original called the supratentorial peanuts, we are all aware of that. This is just a small case, it's a one and a half year old child from African country was uh, referred to as, this child came to the ER just here to deteriorate in the ER and then patient had a pupils were dilated and we had to rush in and just do an EVD. We thought nothing much to be done. We intubated, we just ventilated. Child showed some activities, motor movements in spite of sedation. So we thought we'll go ahead and we did. You can see as a one and a half year old small child, very large disease volume, entirely occupying the ventricles, going across to the opposite side also. But luckily for this, we could get a gross total excision and uh, what we thought is a helpless child, but actually made a um, reasonably uh, better recovery. This is almost two weeks later, and then this patient was, after one and a half years, I think the child went back and we couldn't get the follow-up because it uh, went back to African. Two things which can delay the adjuvant therapy is the post fossa syndrome. All of you are aware, everybody sees it. A lot of methanogenesis, but nobody really understands why it happens. The only thing is that be cautious on retracting the dentate nucleus because generally now we have moved from retracting surgeries to retractor less surgeries. So we hardly use cerebral retractors now because retracting the dentate nucleus is because they are the close to the midline and that can cause these type of uh, issues of post fossa syndrome because if you have to counsel the family, because this is one thing which delays and the parents are very, um, um, very, very apprehensive about this complication which we need to do. The second important thing which I want to stress is the post-op fever, especially in post fossa, especially in medulloblastoma. This fever delays the adjuvant chemo if we start, because majority we think it's a chemical meningitis. So what we do in our center is, can you just play that video? So meticulous arachnoid closure. Arachnoid is like a paper film, so we cannot close it like suturing. So there is techniques, we use a small bipolar current, just hold the arachnoid and give small, small intermittent currents. This arachnoid closes well. And doing this has, we have found that the risk of post-operative fever is much less in these children. And so, so this is one technique which I think most of us uh, should adapt to prevent uh, this type of post-operative fever because closing the arachnoid improves this and because the blood in the fourth ventricle, blood in the central spaces causes this post-operative fever, though they're not infective, we are really worried to start chemotherapy in these children after surgery. So to conclude, Medulloblastomas and other embryonal tumors, the surgery plays a significant role and the standard of care should be safe maximal resection. Whenever deemed possible, better to do early shunt so that they are ready for adjuvant rather than delaying, delaying and delaying the adjuvant therapy as well. You need to counsel the parents for two things, mostly for some mutism and postoperative fever. And now that we have molecular subgroups, we can address the patient, how this child is going to fare. Though we know that these are one of the curable malignancies in children. Needless to say, the multidisciplinary approach is the norm for these tumors. I'm deeply indebted to our team, Jalali, and we have we learn from each other every day. Dr. Susma is missing in this picture. We have, and uh, every day is a learning. Thank you very much for us. Thank you, Dr. Rupesh, for very nice surgical demonstration of techniques. We can have one question. Yes, sir. Okay, okay, sorry. So, we would now, like, now like to call uh, Dr. Chitra Sarkar, madam. Uh, Madam needs no introduction. Uh, she is professor, Department of Pathology, Ames, and a former president of this room. Madam will be speaking on practical implications of molecular analysis of embryonal tumors with emphasis on immunohistochemistry. Wear the right uniform. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, th I thank the organizers for this uh, opportunity to speak on embryonal tumors, which over the years has undergone radical change in the successive uh, CNS, uh, WHO CNS classifications. So this was the group which used to be called as PNETs. All of us are very, very familiar with PNETs. And this was the group which used to be put under PNET. 
So there, uh, but now the term PNET has been completely removed and uh, from the 2016 classification onwards. So PNET is only for peripheral tumors now. For the CNS, we no longer use the word PNET, but we use embryonal tumors. And this knowledge comes from a lot of uh, the not only mor uh, morphology largely contributed by all the molecular studies which have helped to delineate the change the molecular alterations which are so different in CNS versus the peripheral uh, neuroectodermal tumors or the PNETs. So uh, embryonal tumors, uh, they are of course a very heterogeneous group. They are all malignant, right, composed of these immature cells resembling neural progenitors and largely a disease of childhood. So uh, as we see in the CB trust data, and I always show this uh, multi-centric study because I think as we discussed in a meeting yesterday with Professor Jalali, that we need to have more multi-centric data and this should be a vision of ISNO uh, in the next uh, decade possibly, where more data from the Indian uh, studies come in from uh, several centers. So uh, the, the medulloblastomas and the other other, uh, the uh, embryonal tumors constitute about 15 to 20 percent of the childhood tumors. Now, uh, the uh, 2021 or what we call the WHO CNS5 or the fifth edition of the uh, classification which has come out divides them, of course, into medulloblastomas and other CNS embryonal tumors. And medulloblastoma is histologically defined and molecularly defined. And I think by now I need to, uh, the uh, audience here needs no introduction because for the last maybe five to six years, we have been talking about medulloblastomas, WINT activated, SHH activated, and the non-WINT, non-SHH uh, activated. The SHH activated has got further divided into P53 mutant and wild types with prognostic significance and non-WIND, non-SHH into group three and group fours. I'll go into uh, subgroups a little later, whether they are really important or not. But the other CNS embryonal tumors, we all knew from the 2016 about ATRTs and the ETMRs, embryonal tumors with multi-layered rosettes. But three new entities have been added in 2021, the CNS neuroblastoma FOX R2 activated, the CNS tumor with BCOR internal tandem duplication, and a provisional entity, the cribriform neuroepithelial tumor, where the grade has not been assigned. So these are relatively new entities because as you can see, the grade is not assigned either to BCOR internal tandem or to the cribriform neuroepithelial tumor. Though, uh, and uh, in uh, in addition, crib reform remains a provisional entity. The uh, histologically defined in the earlier classification, they used to be the under the histologically defined classic, desmoplastic, the MBEN, and the large cell anaplastic. Now, these have been put under subtypes in the main section. They are not listed in the original in the classification, but they continue to be the four histologically defined types of uh, medulloblastoma, which we are all familiar with. Now, uh, and this is very time-tested histological definition. I won't go into details for lack of time, but the risk stratification is important because the best prognosis is with the MBEN and the worst prognosis. So if you see a histological uh, large cell anaplastic, it carries a poor prognosis. The classic have variable outcomes, which depends on the molecular phenotype subtype. And desmoplastic has, or the nodular have excellent outcome in infants and younger children with no survival difference between desmoplastic and classics in older children and adults. Now, uh, coming to the uh, molecularly defined, this is the WHO table, which lists the differences. And I'm going on only to highlight the dif important differences between these molecular groups, which will help in us to come down to IHC and how we can use it for a regular subgrouping and whether IHC is sufficient or we need more markers. So as you can see that uh, uh, the classic type of medulloblastoma occurs over the spectrum of all molecular subtypes. The desmoplastic nodular is largely in the SHH subgroup, more in the P53 wild type. 
The uh, large cell anaplastic is mainly in the subgroups of P53 mutant SHH and in the group 3 of non-Vent non-SHH subtype. So this is something very important. So classic histologic can belong to any of the molecular subgroups. The large cell largely belongs to group three or to P53 mutant and desmoplastic nodular is practically confined to P53 wild type, uh, the SHH activated. Now look at the amplifications, which will be important. Why, the MIC amplification has a lot of prognostic significance. So where do we see the MIC N and the C MIC amplification? So MIC can be N amplifications or the C amplifications. The N amplification is seen in the P53 mutant SHH. As, and in group three, you can see both the MIC C and the uh, MIC N amplification and also in group four. So th this is an important amplification which has prognostic significance in addition to the others which are listed here. And of course, in the wind activated, what do we see? Monosomy six or the CTNNB1 mutation which corresponds to the uh, immunohistochemical counterpart, which I will show you, and P53 mutation in the P53 mutant SHH activated type. Now, what is the importance of all this? In addition to the differences, that thing is the prognostic significance, which we all know that the winds have the excellent prognosis, which are the two poor prognosis categories. One is the P53 mutant SHH, and the other is the group three non-wind non-SHH. And you will see the corollary that they are largely large cell and they have the MIC amplifications and the P53 mutations. P53 wild type intermediate and group four is intermediate and the five-year OS is listed here. So prognostic significance of the molecular groups. Now, the WHO this time has come up with subgroups. I will not go into details because it's very difficult in routine IHC to, or in a routine, even the routine molecules like fish and sequencing to make out the subgroups. Uh, it, it, they also have some clinical pathological and demographic differences, but most important again is in their prognosis. But the P53 mutant in the SHH subgroup, uh, the three has the, the poorest uh, prognosis. The non-wind non-SHH has eight subgroups belonging to group three and group four. And again, the worst prognosis is of subgroups two and uh, three, which have the MIC amplification. So it is important to note that these corollaries go, uh, go with the P53 and the MIC amplifications and the histology. So uh, since the title is largely um, on my is how is the practical applicability? So medulloblastoma you diagnose, which is not a great problem clinically, radiologically, and of course histopathology, we tell you the, uh, the histology subtype. But you want the subgrouping. Yes, it's very important to the uh, clinician and the oncologist treating. Now we had come out with uh, Tejpal was the main person, and Dr. Jalali, who steered this. The first um, uh, publication from the Indian Society of Neuro Oncology on the consensus guidelines for contemporary management of medulloblastomas. And in this, you uh, the what the WHO says. There's one thing about WHO which I want to make clear to the audience here. They list out the uh, molecular techniques, but they don't tell us what are the techniques which should be done for uh, each uh, um, uh, marker. They are quite, they avoid giving uh, directions as to which will be the best marker for what. So you have to choose depending upon your resources and your other uh, turnaround times, et cetera, as to what you will do. The DNA methylation, which we have a lecture by Dr. Vaishali tomorrow, is the gold standard for grouping and subgrouping of medulloblastomas as of today, followed by gene expression profiling. You have the nanostring counter assay and uh, the TMH also has a real-time PCR assay, which they do before the grouping. Then you have FISH, uh, fluorescence insight to hybridization, sequencing, and the one which is the most pathology friendly with a very uh, quick turnaround time and can give is, of course, IHC. Next. 
So uh, if you ask me for the uh, for what would be the practical applicability in most pathology centers now IHC is available and the three markers which have now become time tested which we first published in brain pathology uh, 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 quite some time back and is now in the WHO is the three antibody panel which is followed by practically all centers some add a fourth antibody called filament to it but generally beta catenin GAB1 and and YAP1 are uh, quite useful in routine practice to make three subgroups, that is WINT, where the beta catenin is positive, uh, the SHH, where the GAB1 is positive, and uh, the uh, YAP1 is positive both in WINT and SHH, and non-WINT, non-SHH is negative for all the markers. However, in addition to these three, because there are sometimes problems in interpretation of immunohistochemistry of beta catenin and GAB1, it's I, if you ask me for a personal recommendation, I would say supplement it with fish or and or sequencing depending on your resources. Why? Because it's very important to identify either the best prognosis group or the worst prognosis group. For the best prognosis group, that is the WINT, you can supplement the beta catenin with monosomy 6, which is done by FISH, or by CTNN1B1 mutation, which is done by sequencing. It's a single gene. It can be uh, sequencing is easy. And now even the outsourcing sequencing has become very cheap somewhere from, it can range from 500 to 800 rupees, depending depending upon the primers, maximum maybe a thousand. For the uh, worst prognosis group, it is the MIC amplification. So if you can do FISH by MIC amplification, for neuroblastomas, we do FISH amplification. So similarly, we can do a MIC C or a MIC M amplification, which tells you a worse prognosis in the group three or in the, uh, the uh, SHH P53 subtype. P53 mutation, unlike in the uh, gliomas where there are certain areas where these uh, certain uh, loci which are more susceptible to, here you have to do the whole of the P53 mutation. Unfortunately, in uh, the uh, medulloblastomas, immunohistochemistry for P53 is not positive in all the cases. And you have to look for diffuse immunopositivity. So sometimes it does not correlate with the mutational status. And therefore, you do a P53 along with beta catenin, GAB1, and YAP1, only if you see a desmoplastic nodular or a large cell anaplastic and, uh, medulloblastoma. But it has to be corroborated with P53 mutation studies. So um, in my opinion for medulloblastoma, IHC supplemented with FISH and or Sanger sequencing for these markers would be the best depending upon the resources. Now, uh, briefly about the other CNS embryonal tumors, which are rather rare, and I have tried to put to uh, their uh, comparison. They are all childhood tumors, as you can see, and very young age. The ATRT less than five years, uh, ETMRs less than four years, generally below two years, and the others which are relatively new entities with few groups of cases described. But unlike medulloblastoma, which is always cerebellar, these can occur both infratentorial and supratentorial, rare in the spinal cord. And the cribriform neuroepithelial tumor, the new entity, is mostly in the vicinity of the ventricles. They all have uniformly poor prognosis. And with ATRT and with numerous uh, clinical trials on, still the three-year uh, OS seems to be around 22 to the highest 35% with stem cell rescue and various other things uh, going, which you, uh, I'm sure all of you know about. So very briefly, hist histologically, ATRT is very classical. If you see the rhabdoid cells, but not all cases show rhabdoid cells. And uh, it has a polyphenotypic uh, uh, differentiation of uh, immunohistochemical markers being positive for mesenchymal, epithelial, as well as uh, the glial and neuronal markers. But the most important genetic marker is the loss of INI1. And INI1 is available by immunohistochemistry. So we can do the loss of INI1. But I have to put in that there are now well-described 
I and I one positive ATRTs because there the genetic alteration is the SMARC C B four uh, alteration, not the SMARC B one alteration. There you have to do so if you look classical ATRT, but your I and I is still uh, positive. Do the immunohistochemistry for Brig one. The BRG one loss indicates ATRT with the SMARC uh, C four uh, mutation. There are subgroups again described based on uh, DNA methyl uh, methylation studies for ATRTs. Again, the prognostic significance of the subgroups is not clear, so I will not go into details. The ATR, uh, the ETMRs that we all know have three histological variants which have a molecular commonality. There is the uh, embryonal tumor with abundant neuropil and true rosettes, ependymoblastomas, and medulloepitheliomas. But do we have an immunohistochemical marker? Because uh, I, I was told to give the practical app, app, uh, applicability. Yes, LIN28. If the morphology is of any of these ETMRs, uh, either etanker, ependymoblastoma, or medulloepithelioma, where the characteristic is the ependymoblastomatous rosettes, then you can do a LIN28. And if LIN28 is positive, it, it uh, helps. It's a sensitive, but I must tell you that all of these are not very specific. And my last slide will show that. You can supplement this with FISH for the C19 uh, microRNA cluster uh, amplification and fusions to help establish the diagnosis. So FISH forms a very important component to supplement along with IHC. This FOXR2 activated is totally a diagnosis based on uh, the uh, DNA methylation. Synaptophysin and OLIG2 are positive in this, but th these are general, uh, general markers. It does not have any IHC correlate to bring out FOXR2 activated. Some are being postulated, but they have to be verified by others. The CNS tumor with BCOR internal tandem duplication has a very protein histology. And uh, it has a relationship with mesenchymal tumors, though it is put under embryonal tumor. And its uh, most important uh, positivity is for Wymankin and CD56. It's in fact negative for neuronal markers like synaptophysin. OLIC2 can be positive or negative. And it has an immunohistochemical correlate that is BCOR. Again, uh, expression of this is a sensitive marker for its diagnosis, but not specific. DNA methylation is conclusive. The last is a cribriform neuroepithelial tumor, which needs mention because it has loss of INI1. It is another tumor which has been found to have loss of INI1 with mutation at SMARC B1, but it lacks rhabdoid cells and has this characteristic cribriform pattern as the name indicates. So these are rare, but we know about them. And uh, can is, is there an importance of going, what uh, Sridhar asked, a very important question and many others, with the, does the treatment change? Yes, medulloblastoma subgrouping is very important now that we know. And uh, similarly, for the embryonal tumors, the ATRTs and some evidence for separate treatments for ETMRs, as Dr. Jalali tells me, is also in the, uh, is coming up. So if we compare all these uh, no, uh, other CNS embryonal tumors, we need to have the following uh, um, uh, surrogate IHC markers. One is INI1. Again, INI1 loss, sensitive but not specific. I want to bring to your notice that it can be positive in some of the schwannomas, poorly differentiated chordomas, in cribriform neuroepithelial tumors, and another new entity described in WHO 2021 in the pineal region, desmoplastic myxoid tumor, which has INI1 mutation. So at least within the CNS, there are three tumors with INI1 loss in uh, AT, uh, ATRTs, uh, and uh, along with ATRTs, that is chordomas, cribriform neuroepithelial tumors, and the pineal SMARC B1 mutant tumor. Similarly, BCOR can be positive sometimes in solitary fibrous tumor. LIN28 can also be positive in some gliomas, ATRTs, germ cell tumors, and some non-CNS neoplasms. So they are sensitive markers along with the histology, but not 100% specific. This is one thing about the IHC markers, which we have to keep in mind. 
So to sum up, if you ask me the practical, yes, IHC is very important. That forms the baseline. So if it is a medulloblastoma, the, the central IHC for routine for all these neuronal tumors would be synaptophysin, vimentin, olig 2 and GFAP. This uh, is important for coming to the various uh, diagnoses by exclusion because some may be only vimentin positive, as I told you, the BCOR. Some are both synaptophysin and olig 2 positive, like the FOX R2 CNS neuroblastomas. Then, uh, after you have established your diagnosis of whether it's a medullo or the other non medullo CNS embryonal tumors, you go on to the next immunohistochemical panel for medulloblastoma, it is for molecular grouping, beta-catenin, GAP1, GAP1, and P53 only in selected cases, as I mentioned. For the non-medulloblastoma uh, embryonal tumors, you can use INI1 for ATRTs, LIM28 for ETMRs, and BCOR for the CNS tumor with BCOR ITD. And uh, if you have the resources and the facilities, I would say the next step that all of us should be looking for is fish and or sequencing to supplement this. For medulloblastomas, fish for MIC amplifications for the poor prognosis and the monosomy 6 for the WIND subgroup. Or you can do a sequencing for CTNN1B1 mutation again to identify and be sure of your WIND subgroup and P53 mutation. I must tell you that some WINT do show P53 mutation, but do not carry the same prognostic outcome as SHH P53 mutations. So uh, sometimes P53 mutations, uh, it, it, is, it may be important to do. Non-medulloblastomas, the, there is only for ETMR C19 MC amplification, which you can do by FISH, or a DICER-1 mutation. About 5% of ETMRs show a DICER-1 mutation. So this is the IHC panel, which along with FISH or sequencing, will help in the routine management of the practical applicability of this complicated group of embry embryonal tumors, both diagnostic and to some extent prognostic. This flowchart is uh, similar to what I have told you now. So to conclude, the assessment of molecular characteristics is now considered the standard of care for CNS embryonal tumors. And as per WHO 2021, the, it is the DNA methylation profiling and gene expression profiling, which are the gold standards for this group of tumor. But we can't think about it in our country where a single case costs more than 40,000 rupees and nobody does a single case. So the very high, high turnaround time till they get about six to eight cases which go in one chip. So immunohistochemistry supplemented with fresh or Sanger sequencing for selective markers, markers which have prognostic significance or diagnostic in terms of management as practical guides can be helpful surrogates for analysis of the molecular alterations. And we can give integrated diagnosis within our economic resources, uh, limited resources using both histological and the molecular information, which can be translated to patient care services. And one last important thing to remember about these embryonal tumors is many of these CNS embryonal tumors have inherited cancer syndromes and require genetic counseling, especially those with, uh, say, rhabdoid tumor predisposition syndrome. Uh, in a patient with SMARCs, uh, B1 deficient tumor can be as high as 26 to 41 percent. For the rhabdoid tumor predisposition syndrome in a patient with SMARC4 uh, deficient tumor, it's much higher. And similarly, almost all the patients with the DICER1 ETMR carry a pathogenic DICER1 germline mutation. So looking for uh, inherited cancer syndrome and genetic counseling is very important in this group of patients. So uh, I like to show the slide in the end because really the WHO classifications are becoming very challenging to us and it's a never-ending road with every classification bringing in more markers, not only confusing, but also to the pathologist, very challenging to see where do we strike the balance between our uh, between the practical applicability, the resources available, the cost of all these, the turnaround times, etc., vis a -vis, uh, the patient care management, which will change with all these markers. So thank you all for the patient hearing, and I thank my team of neuropathology for all their support and help.
Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chitra Sarkar. As always, uh, listening to you has been a, a real pleasure. A very complex uh, topic is has been so much simplified and uh, putting into perspective the role of uh, IHC, which is uh, now becoming the backbone of uh, starting of these investigations. And I don't, uh, the questions we take at the end. So I would like to invite uh, Dr. Acharya Das Gupta and uh, for speaking on challenges in radiation planning of adult and pediatric embryonal tumors, no margins for error. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So um, after the last two talks, once the tumor is out and we have the diagnosis and complete molecular diagnosis, so now it is our uh, time to proceed further with therapy. So I'll try to uh, go through the challenges that we face as a radiation oncologist. Some of the jobs are very easy. Some of the technical challenges are there. So I do not have any conflicts of interest to disclose. So one of the major things whenever we consider these patients for adjuvant treatment is to look at the survival. And with the massive shift and understanding and stratification, we have a fair amount of idea like uh, wind group is living longer or the group three metastatic. So we have moved beyond the conventional restratification as well as uh, for other tumors, non-medulloblastoma tumors like universally, they are taken as, as a very, uh, having a poor prognosis. So that's very important when we talk to the patients, counsel about the treatments, discuss what are the implications, what are the expected side effects, and that guides the treatment decision a lot. So uh, like we all know, like brain is continuously developing more so in the earlier period of childhood, and it continues to develop like a different functions, and it develops throughout the adolescent period at least till 20, 30 years. So that has a major implication, particularly the cut of age, the lowest cut of age when we consider these patients for treatment. Like I said, many of these patients will be living for five years, 10 years. So at what cost they're living, that is very important to decide. Also, there are other factors uh, which are concerning that came up in the previous talks, like the endocrine function, the vertebral function in uh, prepubertal uh, pediatric patients. So all these things uh, we have to uh, bear in mind when we are proceeding with treatment. And uh, this is a very important uh, uh, publication that came up in the New England a few years back. So it is showing that not just the disease, like uh, there is a major contribution from treatment related or other uh, disease related, not the disease related, the treatment related morbidity. And if you see here in this plot, like uh, slowly we are improving, uh, with time, possibly with better diagnostic abilities to, this, uh, to uh, detect the late effects or better rehabilitation strategies, but still it's a significant concern. And also uh, on the right hand side, you can see here that uh, there is always cognitive deterioration. More earlier, the kid gets radiation, the higher dose, and this has been well described now with some limitations in the recently published Pentec data. So there are a lot of whole spectrum of uh, side effects and also uh, in general, post-treatment from disease, the survivors have an accelerated aging. So when we talk of treatment of embryonal tumors, uh, I think all of us know here that we have to treat the craniospinal axis and give higher dose of radiation to the thing. So we treat a lot, possibly uh, like as radiation oncology, total marrow radiation or other things, like possibly this is one of the longest axis or the largest volume of radiation that we deal with. So that is its own challenges. And at the same time, we have to save a lot because you can see here uh, in the right hand side, this is the vertebral body. We have to, this is concerning. We have the lungs, the thyroid, the kidneys, the spectrum of each of the toxicities can be very different. At the same time, we have to give higher dose to the prime from the posterior fossa where the tumor has been removed. Uh, typically, we call as a tumor bed. And uh, here also you can see there are the cochlea, which can have implications on hearing. So we have to choose and decide what we are looking at and we have to balance accordingly. So, and other major challenges uh, is to decide for the treatment, particularly the ATRT, the ATMR, the non-medulloblastoma tumors, where they're diagnosed in infancy, many of them will be less than three years. So what is the optimal time when to treat and what to discuss with the uh, patient's family? So first of all, like I said in the first slide, the restratification. So we 
go and choose accordingly. And so the main principle for radi as a radiation oncologist is finding the optimal balance as far as we can increase the uh, therapeutic window. So uh, we have seen a lot of uh, developments in the technology, right from we are used simple radiation, like a 2D radiation techniques from uh, IMRT using modern linear accelerators with image guidance. And certainly Dr. Jalali has developed the proton center and we are also excited to get that in our center soon. So this has helped us in minimizing the dose, but also that we have to be very sure like what we are drawing cause uh, as a target, where would you want to give radiation? Where do you want to save it? Because it becomes very challenging and critical as we are moving towards higher conformal techniques. So just uh, to summarize uh, here, like the, what is the role of radiation? I don't think this is not like any uh, great two or like a typical meningiomas where the debate is still continuing. It was established over 50, 60 years back. Yes, certainly radiation is needed because it massively improved the survival and medulloblastoma or other embryonal tumors are very sensitive, radio sensitive tumors. So earlier, like in the uh, 40s, 50s, survival in medulloblastoma was a case report, then it became case series using kilo voltage radiation beams and certainly we have no meta-analysis systematic reviews. So uh, restratification, that is one of the most important things to decide the dose of radiation and the sequencing of radiation. So uh, as per the uh, earlier that came on JCU by Gelser, like we know that medial blastoma is conventionally stratified and it is still used like a high risk and average risk or standard risk disease. So in any of the factors, when a kid is less than three years, the residual is more than 1.5 centimeters square or there is presence of any metastatic disease anywhere, which is considered as a high risk disease. And this decides the dose of radiation, particularly to the craniospinal axis, as well as um, the role of the systemic therapy. So when we talk of radiation dose, so we can uh, simply consider that anyone who is less than three years, some centers use a different cutoff in the West. So in our center, we are practicing a three years cutoff. The patient goes for chemotherapy and they like we try to postpone it as much as possible. And then they are planned for radiation with a uh, full dose, like a craniospinal that is 35 to 36 spray. And for other high risk categories, uh, like usually it's a, uh, we give 35 gray, and if there is a higher metastatic burden, we can go craniospinal up to 40 gray. So the tumor bed, like the, what the primary site of the disease in all these cases, receives a total dose of 40, uh, 54 to 55 gray of radiation. Another, so in standard risk disease, so for pediatric group, so it was shown uh, by Packer's group uh, that we can use a reduced dose of CSI, that is 23 to 24 gray of radiation. That again, the total dose to the tumor bed is same for 54 to 55 gray. And also with the addition of uh, adjuvant chemotherapy, which Dr. Dharani, the subsequent speaker is going to uh, enlighten us. For adults, there is uh, the, even if it's a average risk disease, so there are debates, across, there is some differences in practice. So in general, the compliance to chemotherapy in adults is poor. So, and the concerns of higher dose of CSI still can be a little bit less compared to when they're getting in a uh, earlier age group. So we can, like in our center, we are practicing more of 35 for our standard dose of CSI and avoiding adjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, with the recent data, just to summarize, uh, just to tell here that uh, since some data has coming up for wind medulloblastomers where it has shown that cyclophosphamide-based chemotherapy has a major impact on the outcomes, so slight modifications we are trying to consider in our uh, institution. We are treating these adults, we prefer to give them chemotherapy, although they are standard risk disease. So timing and sequence of radiation, it's very clear. These are all over uh, 20 years old data, which has shown radiation needs to be started earlier. The treatment interruption has to be less. So usually it is around 45 to 50 days of radiation, uh, the total duration of radiation and any breaks or interruptions has an inferior uh, prognosis. Similarly, the time to start radiation is also important. So we should give sufficient time, at least three to four weeks for the wound to heal, for the child to recover, and then the radiation should be started as soon as possible. And it was shown from a recent publication also that over actually their cutoff was uh, 90 days, that was a poor prognosis on the outcomes. 
So in terms of target delineation, uh, there is, uh, we have to be very careful, particularly at the edges, like I said, and it is again more important now in current practice, the cribriform plates, the inferior temporal horns, the nerve roots lower, so the, for the cranial spinal, the lower part has to be, we have to include the theca, we have to be careful about the cranial spinal axis. So there has been this two, three years back, this was the recommendations that was provided by the SAP group. And uh, we have the recent data by the ACNS uh, group, like which has shown that doing a for standard risk disease, doing a limited boost, because earlier practice was giving radiation to the entire posterior fossa, and it was certainly leading to higher dose to the hippocampus, to the cochlea, and so it has shown there is no difference and the patients can be safely treated with just limited uh, dose, uh, like limited merging to the tumor bed. So techniques of radiation, like I said, standard linac based fixed field geometry, we have been using a lot, helical tomotherapy in our institute, and fixed field IMRT, or now recently we have started since last almost one year, VMAT based uh, IMRT, and uh, more recently, uh, the proton therapy, the data is encouraging. It is important to note that uh, there is some practice, like this is a very recent article that was published in, the, in uh, one of the journals, which was showing the practice variations in the United States, because with times, because it is important. So the dose fall off in proton is so sharp that in a patient who is getting radiation before the skeletal maturity, there is a concern of vertebral deformities. So it is actually interesting to see that with ages, people are using more of vertebral sparing approaches. And uh, Dr. Jalali's group might be able to share uh, more uh, experience regarding this. So one of the major things, uh, that major trial, we started uh, Tata Memorial Center, and we had shown that certainly omitting CSI is not an option. So uh, in weak medulloblastomas, because that is the base group, and even then they need some radiation to the entire craniospinal. So there are multiple trials by different groups that is going on to explore reduced dose CSI uh, in the range of 15 gray to 18 gray. I'll just keep this part. And so, like I said, for ATRT, ETMRs, like they have uniformly poor prognosis in the range of one year or so. So we try to uh, give treat as a high risk disease. If they're less than three years, give chemotherapy and then treat with radiation. In special instances, like this was a recent trial data which was showing that high dose chemotherapy and focal radiation from the CNS 033, they were showing a four year uh, like a progression free survival of approximately 40%, which is very encouraging. So, re-radiation is an effective modality and can be used for salvage whenever possible, selected uh, wisely. So, and standard response assessment, we should follow up these patients, not just clinical examination. And like I said, there are a lot of implications of the treatment. They should be supported. It's always a multidisciplinary management. Rehabilitation is extremely important. And future directions, certainly the data regarding proton therapy is very encouraging. And in our center, once our proton center starts running, we're planning to run a randomized trial to see photon versus proton-based radiation. So I'd like to thank uh, all the patients and my colleagues. And these are, we always like to see these Taiwan paintings that are done by brain tumor survivors. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Das Gupta. We now call uh, Dr. Dharani uh, Jairaman uh, for her talk on concurrent and adjuvant systemic therapy for pediatric and adult embryonal tumors moving together in style. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I thank the organizers for this opportunity and uh, also my uh, mentor, Dr. Julia Scott, for helping me with this. So. I'm standing uh, uh, in between you and lunch, so I'll try to make it as crisp as possible. So, so I'm here to discuss the role of chemotherapy in the embryonal tumors in uh, children. So this classification has already been explained in detail by Chidra Ma'am. So we all know this WHO classification. Uh, I just wanted to highlight one point that uh, we know the genetically defined, histologically defined medulloblastomas and all the other variants that Ma'am has already described. But I put the penialoblastoma here. It's not included under the embryonal tumors in the WHO classification anymore. But uh, in terms of the treatment, it still remains to be the same. So that is the point I wanted to highlight here. So we all know that it's the most common malignant brain tumor in children. 
and it's a highly aggressive tumor. It uh, constitutes around 25% of all the uh, childhood CNS tumors. So we need to do screen the spine and CSF cytology is very important in staging. So the risk stratification of medulloblastoma has evolved over time uh, from the, uh, over the many decades. So we started with a localized versus disseminated disease, the brainstem involvement, and the size of the tumor, size of the residual. And then we have included the age later on and the uh, uh, chance staging for the metastasis, local and distant. And finally, we are here with the molecular risk stratification. We have heard enough about this. I'm not going into the detail, but the risk stratification is still evolving and the risk adapted therapy is very important. Uh, we have known this. So the role of chemotherapy, yes, definite. there is a definite role of chemotherapy in uh, medulloblastoma. So uh, it's in various forms. It's as an adjuvant therapy in uh, newly diagnosed disease, as a concurrent therapy, pre-radiation, I'll come to it, and the recurrent disease in children less than three years, it plays a very important role. So again, a chemotherapy in newly diagnosed disease, it has uh, seen many phases since uh, the, over the last few decades. It was uh, the efficacy has been demonstrated by various trials by SIOP, CCG, and uh, we have learned the efficacy of the chemotherapy in such uh, cases. Earlier, uh, the uh, paper by uh, CCG showed that the uh, difference was not very significant overall, but if they looked at the high-risk patients, definitely there was a different uh, difference in the survival of 48% versus 0% when they have added chemotherapy. Again, the CCG study also showed that there is a definite benefit of adding chemotherapy. And simultaneously, these are all the studies which came up and made the role of chemotherapy clear in medulloblastoma. So as I said, it's a heterogeneous disease. It's clinically, histologically, and molecular-wise. And uh, these are the roles of chemotherapy that we are going to discuss in a child who's more than three years, who has average risk or high risk, a child who is less than three years, and in recurrent setting. So this is just in nutshell to put it in one slide. So the standard risk after surgery, they receive the CSI and adjoint chemotherapy for six to eight cycles. High risk, we know the same adjoint chemotherapy, but there are lots to it. And the infants typically are treated with chemotherapy and the radiation is delayed at least until three years of age. So the general principles, it, chemotherapy should be started not beyond uh, six weeks from the time of radiation. The ideal time would be the four weeks from the time of surgery. The neuroaxial imaging is better repeated before the chemotherapy. And six to eight cycles of adjuvant chemotherapy, depending on the regimen that we use. And uh, all these regimens, again, is based on the risk stratification. So these are the chemotherapy regimens that are commonly used. Uh, uh, especially in uh, our country. So the most common ones used are the cisplatin, lomastin, vincristin, and the uh, other one being the cisplatin, cyclophosphamide, vincristin, and uh, we have the standard protocols for these. So this is the uh, pediatric average risk medulloblastoma. So uh, this is the uh, trial, ACNS 0331, which clearly says that we give vincristin concurrently every week during the radiation, and we go with the Vincristin, Lomastin, or CCNU, and the cisplatin for eight cycles. So, yeah. So uh, the we have already seen this: the chemotherapy improves survival. We have uh, 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 seen this earlier, and for the if we go to the high risk medulloblastoma. Uh, the earlier in prior to 1990s, the survival was less than 50%. With adjuvant radiation and chemotherapy, the survival currently is around 50 to 60% of five year EFS. So, apart from the chemotherapy strategies that we have already discussed, there are many, many strategies which are coming up to improve the survival further by intensifying the chemotherapy which is available by uh, explore, exploring the role of high dose chemotherapy with autologous stem cell transplant and by adding the radio sensitizers to increase the efficacy. So this is a trial ACNS0332, which uh, studied two things. One, adding carboplatin as a radio sensitizer, which had a clear cut benefit, which I shall discuss again. And adding isotretinoin as a pro-apoptotic agent to increase the efficacy of chemotherapy. This trial was started, but it was stopped in between because there was no clear efficacy. So there was a concept about the pre-radiation chemotherapy 
but however the final word is that it there is no uh, added benefit and in certain cases it does confer poor prognosis because of certain uh, delays in the starting the uh, radiation so in the non disseminated disease definitely there are evidences that the pre radiation chemotherapy leads to poorer outcomes according to various studies definitely in the high risk cases there is no role for the pre radiation chemotherapy in children less than 3 years of course uh, the limit main limitation is we cannot irradiate before 3 years so the chemotherapy may becomes the main option and uh, uh, the chemotherapy alone including apart from the whatever drugs we have discussed addition of etoposide high dose methotrexate and the high dose chemotherapy with tiotipa carboplatin with the stem cell rescue has been have been discussed in detail so in young children maximal safe resection is the main key and of course chemotherapy adds to the survival so carboplatin cisplatin etoposide cyclophosphamide vincristin with or without the use of high dose methotrexate and intrathecal methotrexate so again the same uh, concepts are given by various studies ccg the head start and all those things and there is one group uh, of uh, disease in less than 3 years with of those children who had the shs mutation or uh, who which correlates histologically as a uh, nodular desmoplastic or extensive nodularity type who have been uh, able to avoid radiation and are cured and treated well with only with chemotherapy after surgery so these are the uh, various trials which are uh, which have been uh, tried for the young children with medulloblastoma we see the various protocols that have been discussed here so uh, it is very well shown that the chemo helps in delaying the radiation and it improves the outcome and in non metastatic desmoplastic type it definitely it's a treatment by itself so i'm not going into the details and however though it's a busy slide i just want to highlight that there are various studies the main ones being the uh, uh, head trials and head start trials which have clearly shown that the high dose chemotherapy with autologous stem cell rescue especially the ones with tiotipa and carboplatin have clearly shown to have benefits in this high risk group so this is a recent psyop high risk medulloblastoma protocol which is recruiting from february 2021 which the results of which are yet awaited and it says that after surgery those with high risk factors they receive an induction chemotherapy with etoposide and carboplatin and the various strategies of radiation and chemotherapies are are being trialed which the newer ones being uh addition of pimozolamide as the maintenance therapy and the highly uh, fractionated radiation so as discussed earlier the complete elimination of rt is possible in one group in young children desmoplastic nodular variety where the adjuvant chemotherapy alone has been coated to give up to 80 to 90% survival so a word about concurrent chemotherapy with radiation of course we know that we do give when concurrent vincristin weekly during radiation for 6 weeks in the average risk in the high risk with improved outcomes and the concurrent carboplatin has been very well studied it's uh, given either in the dose of 35 mg per meter square per day 4 hours prior to the radiation or as a cumulative dose of 175 mg per meter square per week uh, uh, where we cannot due to the logistic issues we can only give daily however we need to monitor for myelotoxicity and the tolerance has been very well documented and it is also shown to improve the survival by 19% at 5 years for children with high risk uh, group 3 medulloblastoma this was another paper i came across a concurrent oral etoposide with rt it was shown that oral etoposide at a dose of 35 mg per meter square for 21 days and 7 days of along with radiation has been well tolerated and shown to have encouraging survival data but this needs more exploration so the relapse medulloblastoma we don't have any standard approach dismal prognosis if the child has received radiation already the prognosis is very poor there are salvage regimens available but again it includes the same drugs which we have already discussed timozolamide has a better option and if not undergoing the high dose chemotherapy can have a uh, effect however the prognostic factors include uh, localized relapse no measurable residual lesion at the time of consolidation with the high dose chemotherapy and no previous rt would lead to a better survival so the salvage regimens the newer salvage regimens are described under trials the timozolamide irinotecan 
and uh, have been shown to have response in at least 30 to 40 percent of the patients. And uh, the tar targeted therapies, either at relapse or upfront, at the moment, though we have enough molecular classifications, we don't have any targeted agents beyond the SHH inhibition. So all the others are under trial. So the other uh, combination of this pentrexid and gemcitabin is again underway. So the metronidine chemotherapy, it's a well-known concept, if, especially in medulloblastoma. So the combination of various drugs, bevacizumab, thalidomide, celecoxib, phenofibro, titoposide, and cyclophosphamide are very well described. And uh, the combat regimen is very well known. So uh, uh, com coming to the other embryonal tumors, the suprachenturial penis, the uh, uh, role of chemotherapy, it's easy to say, but it's almost follows the high-risk medulloblastoma-based uh, treatment. And of course, the surgery and the radiation may plays a major role in the outcome of these tumors. Penialoblastoma, as I mentioned, follows the treatment similar to a high-risk medulloblastoma. Survival has been mentioned to around 70%. And ETMR, again, a high-risk tumor, follows the similar regimen. However, despite multimodality therapy, the prognosis remains very poor. Finally, a last word about the ATRT. There are various regimens, including platinums, alkylators, RMS protocols, which includes the VDC, IE combination, and uh, which has been shown to uh, give at least 50% prognosis by the various studies, by the French uh, uh, studies. And uh, the... Uh, ACMS 033 trial and the URAP protocols have clearly shown that addition of the high dose chemotherapy with autologous stem cell rescue clearly increases the prognosis, especially in more than three year old. In less than three years, definitely the prognosis still remains low. So, this is how I want to summarize the role of chemotherapy in medulloblastoma in, as an adjuvant, concurrent, and as a residual disease. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dharani, for this uh, excellent uh, presentation. Can we have one or two quick questions or any comments from the floor? Yeah, Dr. Chalal. Three points I wanted to make. One is, I think there are a lot of pediatric oncologists here. We have to stop with Christine somehow. I think we are still living with Christine. Most of the people have stopped with Christine in the average risk. So. Uh, uh, Dr. Ramya, myself, many of us, I was just talking to Dr. Teshpal and Dr. Kurkare also, and unnecessarily adds to the toxicity. So that was one point. Uh, second point I wanted to make was in non medulloblastoma embryonal tumors, particularly ETMR, which sometimes can be close to the brainstem, difficult to operate upon, and also some ATRTs. It has been demonstrated that early local therapy is absolutely critical. So the classic thinking of delaying the radiation for two, three years, uh, Dr. Darni also just mentioned, we like to give chemo for three years, no longer uh, holds true for these rather aggressive tumors, which Dr. Chitra also says, and our experience also shows the same. Uh, and Dr. Rupesh actually showed one or two cases where they can, they tend to be exophytic. So you can actually excise them quite well, followed by focal therapy. You don't need to give CSI in a very young child, whether photon, IMRT, or proton, that does not matter. So that message has to go through the country, which is still not going. Invariably, every week or every month, I see three, four cases where it has been delayed for too long, and then there's extensive relapse, then you can't do much. So early introduction of local therapy, both surgery and radiation in aggressive abdominal tumors, even if they are non medullo omission of Vincristine, these two points we have to inculcate into the pediatric oncology groups throughout the country. I had one question for Madam. The wind pathway, we know everyone is doing wind densification. We also tried, although it was a negative study, but got published in a very high impact journal. Again, giving a message, Dr. Ramandeep was asking where is our Indian data. So we do have Indian data of de-intensification and we modified the for wind protocol of giving only focal RT now to 18 gray in TMH. So that hopefully will come to know. And also we have the experience of high risk, medal of uh, carboplatin in high risk, which Dr. Darni also mentioned with Dr. Kurkure's team. So we have standard guidelines, but all the de-intensification studies exclude adult wind pathways, more than 16 years of age, because they tend to have slightly worse prognosis. So what I have not understood is, are they biologically different? 
why are the adult wind pathways have worse prognosis as compared to childhood wind? I, uh, uh, since that they are not common tumors in the adults, I don't think there is any sort of a uh, data of the genetic alterations between adult and uh, the uh, uh, childhood wind. Uh, as I mentioned in passing that P53 mutations have been seen in some winds. Now, I don't know whether they are more in the adult versus the childhood ones. So maybe one can look whether that is the uh, like uh, thing. So if you have some data on that, you can see. But otherwise, I really don't know any. So I think this is just borne out by perception. And uh, I have been uh, seeing that uh, the wind, adult winds also do as well. In fact, uh, one of the presentations in the abstracts tomorrow is, are they different in childhood and the adolescent and young adult? Uh, Historically, the outcomes that have been published, uh, a few series have shown worse outcomes, but a few series have shown uh, comparable outcomes. Uh, the TMH series shows pretty much comparable outcomes. Look at the COG study, you look at the PSYOP 5 study, I think. Is it the 5 or 4? Where they are excluding the adult for the intensification. Yeah. The low risk is currently defined by age less than 60. Elam has a point. The answer is always in biology. So chromosome 6 loss is less common in adult tumors. So uh, you can distinguish those with chromosome 6 loss and not without loss. And maybe those with chromosome 6 loss do as good as uh, child. Nilam, you used to say, you used to tell us that uh, when we were doing the formula, you said, you actually warned us, don't give focal RT, don't be too ambitious, because they look actually pretty aggressive wind pathway. They have a lot of angiogenesis, we see them classic. Sometimes the mitosis and KI6 is very high, even in wind pathways. So it's not the biology per se, but they seem to be exquisitely sensitive to chemo radiation, such that you have more than 90% survival. But now you are saying monosomy 6, is that the chromosome 6? What we have shown is monosomy 6 has one of the genes that we identified. We saw two uh, mutations in arid one b gene. So it is the same complex as MarCA4. And arid one b gene makes it uh, MAP kinase, AKT pathway, all possible pathways are activated when the arid one b mutation is there. But even without it, it's haploinsufficient because chromosome six harbors it. So, but whatever reasons, maybe that makes it more sensitive to treatment. Okay, and uh, we believe microRNA is also add to the sensitivity. So, as such, if you look at the pathways, all malignancy associated oncogenic pathways are elevated in wind, but they probably respond much better to treatment. So one difference in adult and uh, childhood is chromosome 6 loss. Not all adult medullo uh, wind has a chromosome 6 uh, loss. Some of them don't have. So maybe you can distinguish the, those which respond as good and those which do not. Tejpal, your paper tomorrow, does, do you have, have you done a chromosome 6 in your analysis between peds and adult? So we have to do that. One more uh, comment from, from the floor. Dalali, there is one more comment from the yeah. floor. Hi. Uh, morning. I wanted to ask about the one topic that wasn't covered in the session, and that's the role of surgery. So uh, second look surgery was something which the last speaker mentioned. So you know, as surgeons, we're not very sure about what the role of second look surgery is, especially if you have very small nodule, less than 1.5 cc. So we now stratify them based on histology and molecular subtypes. Uh, so it's not fair to say that all molecular subtypes require a second look surgery for a residual because residuals are very common with medullose given the location and the difficulty in resecting. So is there any consensus about uh, when second look surgery is mandatory and when we can possibly avoid it? The dictum is to remove, I think Rupesh made an outstanding presentation. Yeah, on residual yeah it was addressed. He showed several, especially non medullose which I just explained. Yeah. But there is a fairly uniform consensus that if it is a classic wind, and there's a small residual, you do not upgrade to high risk. You can treat that with average risk, even if the residual tumor is more than 1.5 square centimeter, especially if they go towards the CP angle, which we know. And therefore the radiogenomic study becomes important because Correct. you cannot tell until you have the pre-op MR and Archo actually has, Correct. and many couple of other centers have shown that we can actually predict fairly confidently, just looking at the MR, what the subtype is. If you look at the data, the, it's only 780 odd patient data that's retrospective. We yeah. both know the data. Yeah. 
that showed the maximum impact in group four. four. But group four is the commonest metal of 40%. So That's why I asked that question because group four is being most common. Probably it mandates that nearly every residual would require second look. And we that's should. not. We should. And that's so, not something that we're actually entirely comfortable with. Because if you see most centers, sir, the, the rate of second look surgery, even after it's molecularly group four, is actually not very high, including in our yeah. center. Well, if it is a tiny nodule, you have to chase. Of course, you don't chase. But sometimes, to our surprise, every surgical node, everything removed, but you know the MRI, how it looks. So and there, the, definitely, we must try to decide. Yeah, and, and we are uh, getting more and more information about the molecular and the genetic uh, profiling and their biological behavior and response to various therapies. And we can uh, uh, tailor made more of our treatment. To conclude, uh, uh, final take home pulse, Dr. Acharya and Dr. Dharani. And as we are running late, uh, maybe you can. Yeah, you can. Yeah, kindly uh, keep it short. I think one thing, uh, everything has been covered. And one thing was it's very important. Like uh, one thing I didn't think uh, it came up. Like uh, when we uh, discuss regarding the risk stratification, the timing of MRI and also the CSF studies. Because many times we see it's very confusing. Like uh, what is the whether there's post-op changes. So ideally, it should be done in the first the MRI after surgery, 24 to 48 hours. Or if not, we should delay it by a couple of weeks. And also, we need to do a proper staging. If it's, there is no contrast MRI of the spine, we need to get it done. And certainly, if there is no evidence of metastatic disease or even there is equivocal cases, we should have um, CSF studies. Okay, Dr. Dharani, yeah, kindly, uh, kindly conclude. I have uh, yeah, one um, yeah. comment. Like uh, you mentioned about chemotherapy and all that, but in a non medulloblastoma uh, embryonal tumors, like uh, what is the role? We have gone through a whole of uh, gamut of uh, studies for a high dose chemotherapy and stem cell transplant. Now, that uh, part has not been discussed, but I think for the high risk non medulloblastoma embryonal tumors, there is a place uh, as they are very rare. And uh, uh, Dharani or Ramya can discuss. We follow ACNA 033, and there is another protocol. ATRT always very negative, but actually now 35% five year survival can go up to even 40%. So that nihilistic approach towards ETMR and ATRT should not be there anymore. And early introduction of it is focal, local surgery, and radiation plus high dose chemomanus you would like to take. The infant brain tumors, we've also used the intraventricular method exit approach. And, um, you know, surprisingly, patients tolerate it very well. The chemotherapy tolerance is excellent. It's actually better than, you know, any high dose chemotherapy that you administer. So, as a center per se, we have been using that for many patients. And, uh, you know, they've done quite okay with that. So, um, you know, I'm not sure if we can have a raise of hands for. Uh, usage of intraventricular, not many. Not many are using it. I think. I think we need to conclude it now. So uh, you can let take over. So yeah. So <clears throat> as we discussed, uh, maximum safe resection is very important. Role of surgery very well discussed, and uh, pathology is never ending, as Mom suggested. But we need to get at the maximum uh, uh, to know what it is, so that we can uh, uh, treat plan our treatment risk adapted. So this was very well discussed by Imam and uh, the radiation, of course, definite role, uh, the role of, <clears throat> but in more than three years and up until three years, chemo has the significant role. Sorry, I uh, mentioned about, uh, missed to mention about the intraventricular therapy. So uh, where intraventricular uh, chemotherapy is not possible logistically, the ISN uh, guidelines also suggest a role of intrapecal methotrexate, which is a supplement for that. And uh, though uh, high dose chemotherapy with uh, autologous stem cell transplant has a very clear cut role in most of these high risk tumors, being in a resource limiting setting, it is still not very practical. So I'll stop with this. Thank you. Yeah, so I thank the organizers and all the audience for a very interactive and uh, participating section. Thank you all. <laughs>